Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Crafting and Crime Daily. I'm your host, Rebecca, a.k.a. Crafting Journey, and I recap live trials. So you have something to listen to while you're crafting. Diamond painting, crochet, watercolor, cross stitch, whatever it is you're into. This gives you something to listen to. And I'm on day 15 of this really fascinating trial. Chad Daybell is on trial for the murders of his wife, Lori Daybell's two minor children, Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow. He's also on trial for the murder of Tammy Daybell, also charged with conspiracy to commit those three murders and fraud for collecting life insurance on Tammy after he murders her. Anyway, like I said, day 15. So <laughs> we start off by getting rid of one of the jurors. One of the jurors is sick and was excused by the judge for the illness and will not be returning. So we're down to 17 people sitting in the box, uh, 12 of which will be the jurors. The others will be alternates. So we still have five alternates, so we're okay. And I think the prosecution is getting towards the end. At least I hope so, my goodness. So what a day. Oh, my gosh. Kay Woodcock, life insurance, uh, talk about life insurance. Uh, Heather Daybell, Chad's mom. Oh, my God. Can you imagine? I could never testify against my son. I don't care what he's done. I can't, I, I couldn't do it. I love my son. I mean, she had to testify for the prosecution. Yeah. And later on, we're going to see body cam footage of Lori. So don't go anywhere. That's going to be towards the end. You don't want to miss that. All right. Let's talk about Kay Woodcock. So Kay starts out, she was actually a first witness in Lori's trial, but came up and she's been allowed to watch the trial because she is a victim under the definition of victim. So Kay starts out by explaining the relationship that she had to JJ Ballow. She was JJ's biological grandmother. And, and uh, he was born on May 25th of 2012. And his uh, name at birth was Canaan Todd Trahan. He was born to her son and her son's girlfriend, and they were addicted to drugs. So JJ was born 10 weeks premature. He suffered from drug addiction, of course, and um, prematurity. So and later on, we learn he has autism. So the, this little guy had a lot to overcome at birth. But following that, he goes to live with Kay Woodcock and her husband, Larry. But early on, she's approached by her brother, Charles Vallow, who's married to Lori Vallow. They want to adopt JJ. So... They got to thinking, her and Larry get to thinking, and they're thinking, well, they would make very good parents, and they've got the means, and the, they're young, and, you know, JJ's a challenge. So they allow the adoption with the understanding that they're allowed to stay in JJ's life as grandparents. And she visits, she and Larry visit him very frequently, even though Lori and... Charles are moving around a lot. They're in Arizona. They're in Texas. They're in, you know, Louisiana. They're moving around. They're in Hawaii. <laughs> they're living in all these different places. Kay finds the means. Kay and Larry find the means to go visit JJ. And she said when they did, she didn't spend a lot of time with Lori or whoever, you know, Lori, Charles, or Tylee. She said they were kind of disperse and allow her and Larry to have some, you know, intimate time with JJ. I think that's very nice. Very nice. So the, the custody of JJ was granted to Charles and Lori in February of 2013. And she, she said she got to see him, you know, every couple months, two, three months, you know, which is, it's a lot if you're not living near someone. 
I, you know, when I wasn't living near my grandkids, I got to see them like maybe, you know, Christmas every year. That's, you know, that's why I live near my grandkids now. And I never see them because they're too busy. They're, they're all grown now. Anyway. So after Lori leaves Charles in uh, the end of January of 2019, uh, she started. She started helping Charles with JJ. She uh, she helped Charles move to Houston. That way, she, it wasn't very far from where she lives in uh, Louisiana. She could drive over if Charles had to go out of town. She could drive over and take care of JJ, and that's what she did. Then he gets back together with Lori, and then eventually they split up and. Uh, she was asked, was there ever a chance of reconciliation? She's like, oh, no, they were headed towards a divorce. Then she talked about the life insurance. So she said at one point he, you know, he had concerns about these teachings that Lori was, um, or these beliefs that Lori held. And so he had the life insurance switched to K. And it was with the understanding that, because he had grown sons that Lori had helped raise. So he had two grown sons and he said, I want you to give 250, it's a million dollar policy. I want you to give $250,000 each to my sons, 250 to one son, 250 to the other, which she said she did. And the other 50%, the other 500,000 is for you and Larry. So you can take care of JJ. So uh, she, the last time she saw J.J. Valley was May 17th of 2019. Um, she had J.J. over for his birthday uh, weekend, uh, whatever the 17th fell on that weekend. But it was it was a little bit earlier than his birthday, but she had a big birthday party for J.J. And then she saw him August 10th of 2019 when she FaceTimed with him. And that's the last time she saw him. After that, she tried to contact, because Lori took custody of JJ, she kept trying to contact Lori. She would call, she would message, you know, through social media, she would uh, leave texts. Lori was not responding to her. Um, and then when Charles died, she had everything arranged for JJ to attend his father's funeral. And she had bought the plane tickets, she had everything arranged, and Lori canceled it. And the reason she canceled it is because she learned that Kay was getting all the life insurance. She wasn't getting anything. So she was like, nope, you're not getting JJ. Mm -mm. Nope. Yeah. So when Lori goes off the radar and starts not responding and not letting her visit JJ, and she's had no contact for a while, she starts working with law enforcement to find JJ. Then there's this, uh, like October of 2019, there's this shooting, attempted shooting of Brandon Boudreaux. He hires a private detective. She gets in touch with him and they split the cost of this private detective. So, you know, to find JJ. The other thing was uh, when Charles was still alive, she was helping Charles in his business. She would do some accounting and things for, for him. So she had access to his computers, his emails. She knew all his passwords. She said he had three passwords, <laughs> never changed her mind. She knew all three. So there was one night she was having, after his death, she was having difficulty. Actually, this was November 8th of 2019. Now, Charles is dead, Tammy is dead. Lori and Chad are married. <laughs> I don't know that she knows this. So she was having printer issues at night and she goes to bed and she's like, something just told me I need to, I need to get up and figure out this printer thing. So she turns on the computer and she sees this email notification from Charles's email from Amazon. So she accesses his email and uh, she's like, you know, the, it was something about, um, something item that she had been looking, someone had been looking at. So she calls the private detective and he walks her through how to look at the Amazon search history. And she, she does that. And she finds, she said she was stunned 
she finds malachite wedding rings had been searched, a yellow bathing suit, beach wedding dresses, and linen suits. All these searches had been done on October 2nd of 2019, before Tammy Daybell passes away. They were already planning a wedding. And right around the time, Brandon, you, you know, had this attempted murder. Yeah. And then um, finally, I thought was interesting. She and Larry actually put out a reward for information leading to the, you know, finding J.J. Vallow. So the next person on the stand was Angela Yancey. She is a, um, or was, worked for the school district that Tammy worked for in the payrolls and benefits department. And she explained the life insurance. Initially, Tammy had $50,000 of life insurance. When she became employed in 2017 for that school year, 2017 to 2018, and she elected an additional 10,000. Now, the reason you want to elect this additional 10,000 is because if you don't elect it then, then you can never get it after that. The additional 50,000 is provided by the district. No, no cost to you. But if you don't get that 10, you can never increase your personal contribution to life insurance. So she gets the 10. Then two school years later, September 8th of 2019, during the open enrollment, she opts to increase that 10,000. This is like a month before she's killed, six weeks before she's killed. She opts to increase that to five times her salary, 80,000. Um, so plus that 50, that was $130,000 worth of life insurance. And she also had 10,000 for Chad. Interesting, huh? Okay, she didn't make any changes the second year of her employment, but the third school year, she makes those changes. Well, actually, she did increase Chad's from 10 to 20. She did increase it. So, um, and the thing that stood out to her and stood out to me, I was like, oh my God. Sat Tammy dies on a Saturday. Monday morning. There's Chad knocking on the door. He wants his money. Where's my money? He, she's like, well, you're going to need a death certificate. I got eight copies. I got eight copies. So she has him fill out all the paperwork and he gets the money. And then he's off to Hawaii to get married with the money. Okay. Now let's talk about Sheila. Sheila is Chad's mother. And, um, from other people that have talked about Sheila, she's, you know, very controlled. She's, you know, that's a patriarchal family unit of Daybells. And, you know, Jack, her husband, he's kind of like what he says goes type thing. So she's just like, you know, this meek woman. But uh, she said she last saw Tammy Daybell October 13th. Uh, and she was healthy at that time. This was a baby blessing. So... I don't know what that means. Somebody had just had a baby. I think Emma might have just had a baby. That's that's my, I don't know for that for sure, but I think that's what was going on. Chad and Tammy's daughter had a baby. Um, then she found out that Tammy had passed away and they attended the funeral. She said they also actually went over their house that morning and she said the children were distraught. Chad was distraught, you know. She's not going to say anything different. This is her son. So um, she asked Chad what happened. And uh, he had told her the same thing he tells everybody else, you know, pulmonary and bliss. Anyway, they get together um, in November, sometime in November, mid-November. They're and they all meet up at the roadhouse, you know, they meet Chad at the roadhouse grill for dinner in Idaho Falls. And Chad comes with Lori. Hello. And she notices they're wearing wedding rings. So either she or Jack, somebody asks Chad, you know, Did, are you guys married? And they're like, yeah, we're, we're married. She was a little surprised by that. So she asked, you know, have you ever you know, usual questions. You've been married. Yeah, my husband, he died of a heart attack. And um, then Lori had told her that her she had a daughter that had passed away. Same thing Lori and Chad were telling everybody else. 
very strange. And she was on the stand very short, very quick, very quick. Then we get Heather Daybell, who spent the rest of the morning on the stand and, and several, you know, she was on the stand for a few hours, you know, before lunch and after lunch. She had just had surgery, like a fusion type spinal surgery where they go in through the front. So her voice was not as strong as when I had heard her interview. That interview that I listened to, if you want to go back and listen to that, uh, there's a channel called Hidden True Crime. They did an interview of Heather Daybell. That's three videos long. It's quite lengthy. Um, and I did summarize a lot of that in the episode that I came out with a couple of days ago. Wednesday? Wednesday. If you want to hear like a deep dive into what she has to say about this. But she tells the jury she's known Chad for over 30 years. She's been married for 30 years, but she knew her husband for five years before that. When they initially started dating, Chad was on his mission. Uh, when he returned, she was still in high school, but dating her husband, Matt, Chad's brother. So in 2014, uh, they Chad starts talking about, she, Chad started to change. Well, what changed? Well, he starts talking about these end of life events, earthquakes that are going to happen. They're going to destroy everything in Utah and all the people from Utah are going to run to Rexburg. Um, it never happened. Um, he was having this inappropriate relationship with Julie Rowe. And I'm not, I don't know what kind of relationship, but a relationship. He was her publisher. He was publishing her book and she could see beyond the veil and so could he and they were having visions and they were teaching all this to everybody in Rexburg. Um, well, <laughs> she said the children, Chad's children, all believed what he was saying. They believed the visions. They believed the prophecies. She didn't because she said, you know, she was a, a ranking member of the LDS church on the women's side, they, they, they're very segregated. They've got the head of the men's stuff, head of the women's stuff. She was head of the women's and she wasn't by it. She goes, you know, if that's going to come from anybody, it's going to come from a prophet. It's not going to come from Chad Daybell. And as I explained the other day, she did not want Chad to move near Rexburg where they were, but he did. And she was very upset about it. And she explained to the jury, I was upset because he was teaching all this stuff. Our name is Daybell. His name is Daybell. We're, we're in a small town. People are going to think we believe the same thing as he believes. And we don't. So now one of the things she said about Tammy's funeral that really bothered her was that he played, had the song, Put Your Shoulder to the Wheel played. She goes, nobody plays that song at a funeral. This is a song about working and for the church, you know, for Jesus. And it's not a funeral song. So, yeah. Hold on. There's more. <laughs> so apparently, and this became a big deal on cross-examination. She, as her, she was... You know, they have the wards, which is a few hundred people. Then there's several wards that make up a steak. Not steak like you eat or state, steak, S-T-A-K-E. And she was the women's head of the steak. And the president of the steak had asked her to forward an email regarding some teaching that was going to be done by Chad to all of the 10 ward presidents or, and the women of the wards and, or the, the head of the president, I don't know what they call them, of the wards, the women's president of the ward. She was president of the state. So, and then it would be up to them if they wanted to fold it on to their members. But she added her comments to that email with regard to how she felt about Chad. Now, we didn't get to hear what was in the email. It was lengthy. So, but then she uh, was talking about um, her father-in-law, Jack, 
called her a pot stir because she tried to go to Jack and say, listen, you need to talk to Chad. He's, he's telling everybody these beliefs. They don't align with the church. Um, and he told her she was a pot stir. And then the uh, defense attorney, John Pryor had, you mean like somebody that sticks their nose in other people's business? And she's like, well, yeah, yeah. And that's how they ended the testimony. <laughs> oh, God. I thought that was funny. But uh, on redirect, uh, she admitted that adultery is not conducive to being the executive secretary. And at the time he was having this affair with Lori, he was the executive secretary for the president of the ward or the president of the state. I don't know, something like that. But, you know, he shouldn't have been because he was committing adultery. She felt... Um, that he, she only met Julie Rowe once, but Julie Rowe was very influential. Her books, her book was very popular. Um, and she was giving these talks that would fill up, what did they call it? It's not a temple, um, a gathering about a couple thousand people. And she only met her once and she said, she felt like Julie and Chad were very close and she thought it was inappropriate. And she thought that her, you know, what's your opinion of Chad? He's a very misguided person and he's been involved in several inappropriate relationships with other people. Then we get to David Stubbs, who, by the way, is going to be, continuing his testimony on the stand today, but he had some interesting things to say before he left the stand yesterday, before the end of testimony. So his first involvement, he's a, um, he was the sergeant of the detectives in Rexburg. And he was, his first involvement was on November 1st, when he was contacted by the Arizona police regarding the, the attempted shooting of Brandon Boudreaux. He was asked to do surveillance on this Jeep. So he and several officers go out and they start surveilling. So on that particular day, November 1st, he sees Lori and Chad together and they leave the condo. They were surveilling the condo. At, there was three condos associated with them. And he follows them. First they go to this credit union. Then they go to the, they park in front of a Hobby Lobby and yes, there's crafting involved. <laughs> they go to this Hobby Lobby. I, I'm dying to know what they bought at the Hobby Lobby. I really am. And he noted, he took some pictures of them walking in, and he said they were very, very affectionate, holding hands. She's putting her head on him as they're walking in to this Hobby Lobby. Um, smiling, laughing, you know. His wife just died last week, you know. So, anyway. Next involvement was November 26 when he was asked by again by the Arizona police to do a welfare check that had been initiated by Kay Woodcock, the woman we heard from earlier during the day, um, to check on JJ Vallow. So he took some body cam footage when he approached the apartment of 175, the condo. These are nice condos, by the way. Take a look at this footage. Friend he's with. My friend Melanie. Her son has 
talk to some and it's gonna give I gave him all the information on the phone. Okay, so he can call yeah. Yeah. his partner. Yeah. Why is all this? We're a little what concerned because uh, well the officers were here earlier yeah. for checking and they got a bad vibe that like something was going on here because um, nobody was doing a lot of job and like talk here. It's uh, because a lot of stuff that was going on is gone. No, it's a lot of stuff. So Well that's why we're concerned because it, it just was kinda weird. It is very weird. I had to move around a lot. One of my brothers is trying to kill me. Not the brother that lives here, obviously he's kind of my protector. My other brother was in with my husband who was trying to kill me for my two million dollar life insurance. Oh. So, a lot of stuff has gone on in this last year. It's been a horrible year for us. I've had to move around. And so, I was going to move back to Arizona, put my son back into the school there because I've tried to put him in school here at public school in Kennedy. Okay. He went for two months and tried it, but he had such a hard time. Now, the person who called is my sister in law, but she's his natural grandmother. He's adopted by us. So her son, yeah. who's a drug addict, okay. had a baby with a girl who's a drug addict, yeah. and they took him from, you know, CPS took him, okay. gave him to the grandmother, she came and got him, and then she wanted us to adopt him, which we did. Okay. Loved him. Why us? My husband and I, who died earlier this year. Okay. He passed away. Since he right. passed away, she'd been trying to fight me for him and be really horrible to me and that kind of stuff. The, She's kind of the paternal grandmother. Okay, thank you. So that makes sense. That's what I <laughs> The paternal grandmother. And he has autism and ADHD. He has. He doesn't really talk to people. Like he's he's very special needs. So I had him in a special needs school there. She was trying to. So what happened was, my husband, who we were married for 15 years and had raised all these five kids together, switched his life insurance policy to her. Right? To, <laughs> to his sister, okay. who got a million dollars when he died, and we got nothing. For me and raised JJ, and all the kids got nothing, and everybody got nothing. She got a million dollars. So I knew she was going to try to sue me for him. Or, JJ. yeah, because she now has this million dollars, so she can hire people to help him, and I have nothing. So but you have nothing. legal custody. He's my son. I adopted him right. when he was two years old. We had him from the time he was eight months old until two years old. So she does nothing and wants to cause me trouble. So I don't tell people the truth about where we are and what we're doing because of those reasons. So I look like a suspect, but I am not a good person. Raised all of my kids. I've done everything that I'm supposed to do in life. But everything is causing me trouble right now. So. We don't want to cause you a lot of trouble. How long have you been here? We've only been here since September. Yeah. We moved up here in September. My daughter is going to BYUI. So we just, it's been a nightmare, but I'm going to go back to Arizona so I can put him back in the special needs school. He couldn't do the school here. It was too hard for him. He would scream and cry and take him to school. The principal would have to come out, try to drag him out of the car. Like, it's just it's too hard. But I just don't tell people where I am. I don't tell her where I am ever. And she doesn't have any legal rights to anything. Like, she's been horrible to me since my husband died. I understand she never called me to try to get the child. Interested in town back, you know, but that. Yeah, but she sends me these emails with like the dates and like, like she's putting up court stuff, you know, like she's documenting. I haven't heard from him in all this time, and so I've told her that he's fine. But see, we haven't heard any of that as far as. I'm just saying she's doing this as part of that. Is my understanding. And our only concern in this whole thing yeah, is, that is, he's the, fine. is the child. I got it. And, and so. That's that's where we're at on the head. And then so we I were just a little weirded out when, you know, and, and I understand now that we've heard your side of the story. It's awful. They just yeah. I feel like I'm being tracked all the time. I'm like, why are police coming to my car? Like, they, were, I they said they were no busy with two guys. And I was who was your brother? Who was, yeah. Who was the other one? The other guy they were busy with. There were two. Yes. Well, we had two in detention. Looking for you oh. a little while ago. Oh, because I was up the store. And they ran into well, probably one of your brothers. My back brother there. and his friend, probably. Oh, who's been that? Moving. Chad. Chad Brown. Mm-hmm. No. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right.
Um, yeah, his wife passed away recently. Sounds familiar as an author. Yeah, I know. I think I know one. He's, he's got a couple of daughters. Uh, he has lots of kids. Okay. Okay. All right. Come on. Do you need anything else? Sorry to bother you. Thank you. We don't um, mean to be a problem. I'm sorry right? that people are constantly knocking on the door. <laughs> Nothing for me here. I just don't want to be found. So. Have you had problems? Because I think you only had. My bro- well, the reason I'm moving is because the brother that was going to kill me that was on email and text with his hus- my husband at the time keeps showing up here, so he found out where he's he's knocking on my door. No, this was your brother. One of my brothers showed up here and was knocking on your door. He has a campus. And you said something about you were getting threatening emails. Well, th- no. Just after my husband passed, I found emails and texts between them that they were planning all this stuff. Look, you can tear it out. You don't need to worry about him to come over. Well, that's why I'm moving back. Oh. And, then, and I'm not going to be in a place. I'm going to live with my friend, Melanie. Don't tell anybody her name, Gib, because I don't want anything in my name. I put the apartment in my name, but I didn't stay over here with my brother because he protects me. Okay. And he have me, so. She goes back up. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, I just, like, it's just a nightmare. I mean, I canceled the insurance policy because my husband passed, so there's no money. <laughs> and what are they going to do with JJ and Tyler? Like, what do you believe? Yeah. So. Well, if you have a problem, you feel threatened of, you break calls, you yeah. call someone from a spot or something, you can get not necessarily there. Okay, get out of here. So you're watching. Thank you. So, what'd you think? Adam's trying to kill her? Really? (laughs) So they checked this out, and they said Adam had never been anywhere near that condo. He never left the state of Kansas. I I told you Adam at the time was living it. He's lived somewhere else now, but at the time, he's living in Kansas here in my state. He hadn't even left Kansas. He'd never come to her condo trying to kill her. Um, And then they had checked to see if Tylee was enrolled in BYU never enrolled in BYU. They checked to see if JJ had um, ever been enrolled in a special needs school. Never been enrolled in any special needs school in the area. Yeah. And he knew she was lying about Chad. She said Chad was her brother's friend. Well, he had followed them to Hobby Lobby. And since after that, he found out they were married. And, you know, Clearly, not just your husband's friend. And then he talks about when he was, it, you know, I don't know. I didn't notice it when I was watching the footage. I don't know if you did. But he said, you'll notice there's some stairs be in the background. And there was a picture. And he could see in the picture, in the glass of the picture, that there was this image that kept, a shadow that kept moving. As if there was someone at the top of the stairs moving around. Now, she had said that. Alex was there, but they he never made himself known. And uh, so for officer safety, he kept looking at the staircase, thinking there's somebody up there and they're going to come down because he kept seeing that shadow. But in any case, um, so because of all these concerns that he's having, they get a warrant and they go back a couple of days later and they're, they get a search warrant. And that's when they search all three condominiums, um, the one associated with Alex, where they find the, the weapon cache. They don't find JJ or Tylee. And he says, we really weren't looking for Tylee. We just, we'd hoped we'd see her so she could shed some light on what was going on. But um, um, he also searched, they also searched 174, which was the unit associated associated with Melanie Boudreaux, and they searched Lori's unit. So that's where they left off with the testimony for the day. So you got to come back for tomorrow. (laughs) This this is so interesting. Um, Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, today's Friday. Okay, so I will cover today's, um, I'll cover it tomorrow. Yeah, you don't want to wait the whole weekend, do you? Yeah, I'll, I'll make sure I put it up for you tomorrow. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Take care. And don't forget, I'll be live on Sunday at 11 a.m. Central Time.
just my little coffee and chat show. If you want to stop by and say hello, have a great day. Bye.